And now to our panel. Joining me tonight are Allison Briscoe Smith, director of the Center for the Vulnerable Child at Children's Hospital in Oakland, Eva Patterson, president and founder of Equal Justice Society, and journalist Mina Kim from KQED's California Report. And Mina, I want to start with you because you've been in the trenches reporting on this issue. And Bill Bratton has been in New York, Los Angeles, Boston as commissioner, but not in Oakland. He's had a lot of success in those cities bringing down the crime rate, so that's a hopeful sign. But what challenges, in your experience with your reporting, uh, will he face as he works with Chief Jordan in Oakland? Well, I think his biggest challenge is that he's going to be a lightning rod for the community. He's already shown himself to be that because of his support and his use of stop and frisk. And I'm not sure that his very strong defense of stop and frisk that we just heard in the interview will go over well with community members who are concerned about the racial profiling that might occur if stop and frisk is used. Now, already Chief Jordan has said that that will not be implemented and that uh, Bill Bratton will have a limited role, but uh, Bill Bratton will be facing other challenges besides having a limited role. And one is the fact that he's also dealing with a city that's had a big spike in violent crime, yes. that's lost a couple hundred police officers in the last few years, and that's being scrutinized by uh, the federal court. Let's talk a little more about what you've seen in Oakland, uh, the reduction in the police force, although reporting recently that there will be additions made to the force in Oakland and elsewhere in Northern California. Uh, but let's, you, you've written, you've dug really deeply into this issue and written extensively about and reported extensively on the California report about Oakland residents pleading uh, for officials to pay attention to killings in Oakland. Say more about that. Say more about what's happening on the streets and in, in the Oakland community. What I found is that folks in Oakland feel like they're under siege. And I think they're really hopeful that the attention that's being paid to gun violence after Newtown will Will help to bring more attention. And the group that we profiled at the very beginning, SAVE, is also a group yes. that I spoke with. And one of the things that they're trying to do, besides just trying to get more attention, is also to try to jolt their own community out of an exhaustion mm -hmm. and a sense of numbness from dealing with all of these shootings all the time. Because in that numbness, while it's certainly an understandable response to constant shootings, it, it creates a lack of action. And they want to see more action from the ground up, from the community up. And so that's one thing that I'm seeing. The other thing is I'm hearing frustration about it constantly being pegged as gang-related killings mm. because what the community is experiencing are our grandmothers dying, are their babies dying? And and so to keep calling it gang related to them, I think sounds like it's a way for uh, community leaders or for the city leaders or for state leaders to act like they have some control over the situation, as opposed to really addressing the situation the way the community is experiencing it, which is innocent people being killed. And, and to get the media to respond in an appropriate fashion. Right, I think they'd like to see that change too. E Eva Patterson, le let me turn to you. Why are you so passionate about this issue? Is it personal? Is it political? Both. And what's your response when you hear that Bill Bratton is coming in to consult in Oakland, as he has in many other places, mm -hmm, Detroit, mm -hmm. uh, and we know he's been a commissioner in three major urban mm -hmm, centers mm -hmm, with some mm -hmm. success, mm -hmm. uh, as an Oakland resident, as someone who is uh, the founder of the Equal Justice Society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, what's your response, personal, political, both, and why? I have a range of responses. I was having dinner with a very close friend of mine who's a philanthropist in Oakland, and we were just lamenting the fact that this is just going on and on and on. Mm -hmm. When I watch those parents, I wonder, and I have to put this on myself, where are people like me? You know, I'm a civil rights lawyer, I live in yes. Oakland, why am I not trying to figure out some answer to this? Where are the corporate leaders of Oakland? Why is it just left to the moms and dads on the street? And it's, the preachers. Exactly, yeah. and thank God for them. Um, I also am very nervous about Bill Bratton. Um, stop and frisk generally uh, results in people of color being stopped. There's a prominent lawyer who you probably know who lives in Oakland. Um, he was stopped in the driveway of his home and was stopped by the Oakland police. Now we don't want to malign the police. We all need protection. But what happens is that certain stereotypes about men of color come into play and it affects who's stopped. And that's what's very unnerving. There's an epidemic of an over incarceration of black and brown people. It starts with stop and frisk. 
an activity that might be seen as a harmless activity if engaged in by a white kid, if it's a black or brown kid, they're going to juvie. A white kid may be sent to home, sent home, don't do that again. And it starts this uh, school to prison pipeline. It just starts a whole um, array of problems. So stop and frisk, I think, is really problematic. In Los Angeles, I believe there was a code called NHI. It meant no human involved. This was a police mm, code, yes. which meant black and brown people. Um, the work we've done on brain science and behavioral science seems to indicate that many people associate criminality with black people so and brown people. So having the stop and frisk uh, as a way to deal with this, I think, is an overreaction and is a way that we might just cause more harm. Mm, very concerning. I want to come back to the brain science when mm -hmm. we talk solutions mm -hmm. in just a moment. But I want to turn now uh, to you, Dr. Briscoe Smith, for more of the real world impact on this because, and I know uh, you as well, Mina, have looked at this as a health issue. This is a health issue, isn't mm -hmm. it? A public health issue. Right. It's a public health issue that has uh, broad ramifications for how people are doing and functioning. And even to take it back to the health implications in the brain science, we have lots of evidence that being exposed to this level of chronic trauma really impacts people's functionings and, and their brain. And How, and, how, how yeah. so? What does it do to a community to be under siege? Picking up on what Mina said earlier, over time, mm -hmm. this, this level of violence and, and the number of deaths in a community, and it's not just Oakland, mm -hmm. we could name a number of communities in the Bay Area and across the country right. that are under siege. And so we see a Sandy Hook and we see a number of deaths, 20 children six adults plus the killer and his mother mm -hmm. but over time we see a volume of deaths in a single community that must have an impact on the psyche of the people who live in that community it has an impact on the psyche of the community and it has an impact on the bodies and minds of those that live in the community as well so there's robust research to really document that living in circumstances of chronic trauma will actually impact brain development and potential for health development mm -hmm. and also have impacts in terms of cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes. I mean, there are a number of impacts that are really documented. There's research to support that. To support that being exposed to chronic levels of trauma does that. Um, and there's I actually was on the phone on the way here with a researcher from um, San Francisco Veterans Administration looking into some of that work. Um, awesome. The animal models are there and unfortunately the people models are there too. It's chronic stress is another way of kind of thinking about it. When one has to always be worried about whether or not you're going to be harmed, it impacts the so body. So give us a real world example. I mean, what do you yeah. see in your practice? Who mm -hmm. are the people we're talking about? Mm -hmm. You know, there is, uh, as Mina suggests, this notion that we're talking about gang violence, and mm -hmm. often we are, and, and not that those lives should be discounted mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. but, but what do you see? You're, you're, you're working with children often, or right. young people, juveniles, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not just the victim that's affected. No, the, the, not just the victim, but the family around them. So we work with many children in, at Children's Hospital with children in um, foster care. So we have a program that specializes in kids zero to three. Now those are kids zero to three that are exposed to chronic trauma around them, also within their families, but also many of the folks that we serve have been witness to this type of violence or actually direct victims. And what we see is developmental regression, a lack of progression. We see parents unable to meet the needs of the children because they're so highly traumatized. We see children and infants that are actually stiff and unable to respond. We see really day to day that there's a dramatic impact um, there's also a dramatic impact of being able to help and to intervene and to call folks together. But I think, as Mina described before, is the numbness, mm. uh, hypervigilance, uh, feelings of no future are all kind of characteristics of being highly traumatized as a community. And at the same time, Eva, I don't want to pathologize any community. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not unique to Oakland. No. Uh, this is not unique to any community mm -hmm. in uh, Northern California, mm -hmm. Richmond, mm -hmm. Emeryville. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. a problem in many communities across mm -hmm. the country. And it is uh, a systemic problem, is mm -hmm. it not? It is. And I was also really resonating with what you said. My fiance was murdered. Mm -hmm. um, I am an upper income professional. This was 16 years ago. I'm still dealing psychologically with the impact. Gun I've, violence, even? He was shot in the head mm -hmm. in Kingston, Jamaica. So Law sorry. wasn't there. 
and I'm still dealing with that. And I've had therapy, but if I'm in East Oakland and this is happening mm. every day and I'm six years old, you and I mm. were talking about the children. Do you want to tell that story about the, the kids who were going to the library? Right, the children who were walking to the mm. library mm. and then couldn't go because there was a shootout by their school and then they were on lockdown. And then they had to go the next day with a police escort, but the kids were very aware that they are in a situation of violence. They are very much uh, aware of what's going on around them and it's hard to see little kids reflecting that yeah. back to you. And we cannot have a conversation that is solely about the problem. I want to talk about the solution. So let's go around with a, a panel of women who are so committed to these issues. Let me start, Mina, with you because you've talked to some people about solutions in your reporting. What have you found? Well, I've talked to both physicians and also with the community. So to begin with some of the public health officials I talked to, they felt like applying certain awareness campaigns that were effective um, with other public health issues, like drunk driving, for example, <laughs> when they raised awareness that it's okay to intervene if someone is drunk and about to get behind the wheel. They're saying it's okay to intervene if somebody is going through a bad patch and they have access to a gun. Mm. Go in there and say, hey, you know, let's get the gun out of the house for a while because what they're trying to talk about is not just gun homicides but also gun suicides because gun suicides can lead to homicides. Mm. I mean, arguably the event in Newtown, he could have been suicidal and taking out as many people as he could before he took himself. And so they're talking about that kind of avoidance. And if there's a way to actually, you know, make people feel like that is an allowable or reasonable and a publicly supported intervention, um, then that could help reduce people's access to guns when they're going through a bad patch. Eva, solutions? Um, I want to go back to the kids because we were all just torn up about the kids at Sandy Hook mm -hmm. and also the kids who were survivors and everyone was sad and that was a good thing but think of the kids you were just talking about who go through this every day what are we doing for them so maybe you do this at your hospital but I think some type of therapy uh, psychological support not just for the kids but for the parents in my discussions this week about this topic with people in Oakland, people said people aren't getting educated, so you can't get a job. One good way to make money is to sell drugs. If you're selling drugs, you're going to come into violence because oh, things yes. are really crazy. And so it, there's this chain reaction. And then the last thing is what I talked about before. Why am I not meeting with those parents on the street in Oakland? Why isn't the head of Clorox not meeting with them. Why aren't we feeling like a community of Oakland rather than, oh, isn't it terrible what's going on? I have some responsibility as well. I think many of us do. And maybe this show will be um, a, a catalyst for having that kind of conversation. But we're some smart people in Oakland. I need to know you. I need to work with you. I need to connect with you. I know you. And in Richmond, and in San Absolutely. Jose, and in Emeryville, Absolutely. and in all places, Absolutely. And, and in places that perhaps aren't under siege, mm -hmm. reaching across mm -hmm. the border to places that are. Doctor, your mm -hmm. solutions. I think there are actually a number of solutions that are available. And, you know, as much as we have research about the negative impact, we also have lots of research that there are things that work. Mm -hmm. There are trauma informed and evidence based therapies that are available that we provide at children that a number of folks provide throughout the East Bay. Um, and there's also folks that are up in arms, uh, the folks that are kind of coalescing and doing work. I think the work that's done at some of the high schools, the youth empowerment, youth uprising, mm. youth a lot, there's a number of folks that are really getting folks together, getting the youth together to really stop because they feel this impact in ways that, you know, many people don't. They are seeing their friends and their community be torn apart and there's an uprising. And I think there's a means of actually interrupting on this pipeline. You articulated a pipeline, mm -hmm. um, which I think is true, a pipeline that goes into the prison industrial complex, mm -hmm. a pipeline that actually moves black and brown out of the way, but there's a way to interrupt that. Which and once is, you're in that pipeline, mm -hmm. it's very, very hard to, hard to break yes. out. Very, and the systems that are involved, so whether it's a juvenile justice or a foster care or those kinds of systems. But I think there are ways of interrupting that system before. I think there's education and attention support for parents. Um, and I think there's actually a lot of work that's going on and a lot of hopefulness um, because we're under so much despair mm -hmm. and so much rage. But I think that's actually something that we can kind of motivate to interrupt this cycle. But there are things that can be done. I mean, one of the things I was hearing about actually is a 
simple as people are getting to know their neighbors. Mm -hmm. They're connecting mm -hmm. with them. There's been a growth in neighborhood watch programs, but there's also just been growth in people using social media and other ways of con of connecting with each other so that they can actually, you know, come together and protect their communities. And less isolation, I think, is the key. And yeah. I think perhaps in the media we can do more to help people be aware of this isolation that has occurred. Yes. Uh, and, and I want to thank all of you for being here tonight to help perhaps, as you suggested, spark a conversation Absolutely. about what's happening in our communities. And as you say, perhaps Sandy Hook can, uh, as it seems to have in our country, start this conversation about what's happening in neighborhoods every day across our country. Thank you, ladies, all so much for being here.